Hello, I'm Jim Halfpenny, and I welcome you to A Gathering of Naturalists. A Gathering is hosted by A Naturalist World, an ecological education company located at the north entrance to Yellowstone National Park. Our company sponsors educational programs and research in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. We also host this free lecture series, A Gathering of Naturalists, which highlights the knowledge and expertise of those who live, study, and love the ecosystem. Now, please join us for our program. Hi everyone, my name is Jeremy Sundaraj. I'm a biological technician for the Yellowstone Wolf, Cougar, and Elk Project. And today we'll be talking about the wolves of Yellowstone National Park. So I'll start off by introducing myself. Again, my name is Jeremy. Um, I started coming to Yellowstone when I was just a little kid. Uh, I saw my first wolves here when I was 11 years old. Um, after that, I went to school at the University of Montana and majored in wildlife biology, uh, where I spent some time trapping wolves uh, in the uh, near Missoula for the state of Montana. I also did tagging uh, elk calves uh, for predation studies. We banded sawwet owls. Um, and then I actually spent the summer in northern India doing snow leopard surveys. And I came to Yellowstone National Park, uh, came back to Yellowstone National Park in about 2018 and started working for the Yellowstone Wolf, Cougar, and Elk Project. So that's enough about me. Um, we'll start out by talking about Yellowstone National Park uh, as a whole. So Yellowstone National Park you're all probably pretty familiar with. It's an area of about 2.2 million acres uh, in the states of Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. Uh, the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, however, uh, encompasses about 20 million acres, and that includes public lands, private lands, uh, and of course uh, federal lands outside the national parks uh, as well as inside. So before we get too, uh, too, far, too far along, I want to define what, the, what we'll refer to as the northern range of Yellowstone National Park. Uh, and that's this red polygon we see up on the map. And what that is, uh, is the wintering range for northern Yellowstone's elk herd. Uh, that elk herd is typically between four and 8,000 elk. And in the wintertime, they all go into that area in the low elevations of the northern part of the park. And because of that, uh, a lot of the other wildlife follows them there. So that's where a lot of research in the park is done. So we have a really high biodiversity of large mammals in Yellowstone National Park. We have eight different species of ungulates or hooved animals. Uh, we have about 150 bighorn sheep in the park. We have a handful of moose in the park. Our most abundant large ungulate in the park, like we mentioned, is the elk. Um, we have pronghorn, which are the fastest land animal in North America. We have bison, uh, which are kind of the iconic Yellowstone animal. There's about 5,000 in the park. Uh, we have uh, non-native mountain goats that have colonized the northern parts of the park. And then we have two species of deer, the mule deer, and then actually our rarest uh, deer, our rarest ungulate in the park is the white-tailed deer, which of course is common in the other parts of the country. So there's a lot of old timers here who will actually get more excited about seeing a white-tailed deer than they, will about, than they will about a grizzly bear uh, or a wolf. Because we see such a high um, diversity of these large ungulates, we see a high biodiversity of large predators. So we have about 100 wolves in the park at any given time. We have about 30 to 40 mountain lions in the northern range of the park. Um, we have about 150 grizzly bears in the park, and then we have about 144 black bears in just the northern range. So Yellowstone is a very high density of large predators. So now we'll get into a little bit of history about Yellowstone's predators. Thousands of years ago, we saw evidence of all these large predators present in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. Uh, and then in 1872, of course, Yellowstone became the world's first national park. And then predator elimination programs began. We weren't very friendly towards predators. Uh, you've probably heard popular stories like, you know, Little Red Riding Hood, the big bad wolf and the three little pigs, where the wolf is going to eat your grandma or come huff puff and blow your house down. Um, and because of that, uh, we started to eradicate predators. In 1914, in fact, Congress actually passed predator elimination laws on all public lands. Um, by 1926, uh, the last two wolves in Yellowstone National Park were captured and killed. And for about 70 years, there were no wolves in Yellowstone. In 1973, uh, the Endangered Species Act was finally signed into law, uh, and that paved the ground for recovery of large predators like wolves and grizzly bears. In the 1980s, uh, cougars, which had been eliminated from the park, actually recolonized on their own, uh, and that was pretty quiet. There wasn't a lot of controversy about that. In 1995, uh, we brought wolves down from Hinton, Alberta, and released them into Yellowstone, uh, and that was much more controversial. Uh, however, by 2021, we actually see the highest carnivore biodiversity and abundance um, in over 150 years in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. So this slide uh, basically just gives us the idea that predators were viewed as something bad, right? Like growing up, 
oh, this is a toddler with a dead mountain lion. Uh, it's pretty common to see pictures of settlers with dead wolves that they had shot. Uh, again, we, we did a really good job of eliminating all these predators. We would do things like wire their mouth shut and let them go so they'd starve to death, burn pups in dens, all kinds of crazy things because we hated these animals so much. Again, um, the Greater Yellowstone ecosystem is made up of a bunch of different land types, right? So there's the federal land within Yellowstone National Park, but there's also a lot of other different kinds of land outside the park. So in Paradise Valley, north of the park, there's ranchers that raise sheep and cattle, and those that, you know, come into conflict with predators. Uh, there's hunters outside the park, and, and for a lot of people around the area, uh, killing, a, killing a big elk or a deer uh, is how they support their family or how they feed their family. Um, as the predators have recovered, like wolves, black bears, and mountain lions, uh, there are hunting seasons that have been implemented on the state lands outside the park, and grizzly bears will probably soon follow uh, in the same direction. However, inside the park, we see a much different story. Um, this is a pretty common scene in Yellowstone National Park. Any, at any point where there's a wolf or a bear close to the road. Thousands of people come every year specifically to see these animals. A study done in 2001 found that wolves brought about $35 million into the local economy. And since then, it's probably increased pretty dramatically. So we'll start to dig into some wolf biology now. Um, this is a basic food pyramid. So in the 1920s and the 1930s, we eliminated wolves and cougars. Uh, we tried to eliminate, co to eliminate coyotes. Uh, but we weren't, and we didn't eliminate bears. But because of that, we saw an increase in their prey, right? So a lot of elk all of a sudden. And because of that, there was some, some suppression of grasses, willows, aspens, and cottonwoods. And that actually trickles all the way down to the soil. So it's pretty crazy to think that a predation event like this uh, can, uh, can trickle all the way down to, these, to the soil. So the wolves' predation on elk affects the ground, um, which is pretty insane if you think about it, right? Uh, every cog of an ecosystem is very important, and if we don't understand what one cog does, it's really important for us not to take it out. So in 1995, uh, Yellowstone National Park righted a historic wrong. Uh, they caught 14 wolves in Hinton, Alberta, brought them to Yellowstone National Park, we kept them in pens for about 10 weeks to get them used to the park, uh, and then we released them into the wild. Long story made short, the reintroduction was wildly successful. So early on, um, we see Packed territories were really large because there weren't a lot of other wolves, so the wolves were making more exploratory forays outside the park, and there were fewer packs. Uh, the population peaked in about 2007 uh, with about 170 wolves, and we what we can see here in this map is there are a lot fewer packs. However, there are a lot more or a lot more packs, and, and the territories are a lot smaller and a lot more wolves. Uh, by 2008 to, through the last decade or so. The wolf population stabilized at about 100 individuals with 10 different packs. Um, and this is actually a map that was made by Aaron Staler, who's uh, uh, one of the high-ups in the wolf project. And this is hot off the presses, so this is our 2020 uh, wolf pack territory map. So right now in Yellowstone National Park, at the end of 2020, we had nine packs with about 123 different wolves. And it's been pretty stable around that number. So now that um, the reintroduction has been so successful, we've shifted... Uh, to a monitoring and management phase, uh, uh, along with research. Uh, so we try to keep radio calls in about a third of the wolves in the park. Um, so that means every year we will, we will go out in a helicopter and we'll shoot wolves with a dart or a net gun, and then we'll capture them, uh, put a radio collar on them, and we'll take some samples. So we'll first draw blood, uh, we'll look at the teeth to age of the animal, um, we look for disease, and then we'll release the animal back into the wild. And those radio collars allow us to do a lot of different research projects. Number one, it allows us to just keep tabs on the population as a whole. So we can fly over each pack uh, and count them at the end of the year so we, we can keep tabs on how many wolves are in the park. Uh, we can also do that from the ground from time to time if we get, get an observation of a pack from the ground. Um, no one was expecting wolves to be as visible as they were or as they are when they were reintroduced into Yellowstone. Because of that, we implemented 30-day winter study periods uh, where crews are assigned to a ground pack and they follow that ground pack for 30 days. And during that 30 day period, they try to keep them in sight for all daylight hours. So we're following their activity from dawn to dusk. Uh, and we're recording basically everything they do. We record their behavior patterns, what they kill, their interactions with other animals. And over the last 25 years through those study periods, we've learned more about wolves uh, than all the years leading up to that. Of course, um, outside of those study periods, we are still out monitoring wolves really frequently. So almost every single day, 
um, there are people out in the park watching and monitoring Yellowstone's wolf population. And that's helped us to, to gain a huge understanding of wolves uh, over the last 25 years. So winter study isn't always fun in games. You can see in this uh, up, upper left corner here, um, a lot of times you have to sit in the snow and it's pretty cold. At Yellowstone can get uh, pretty dicey. Over this last week we had a, a temperatures of minus 25 in the park. Um, it doesn't really matter the weather conditions to some degree. Uh, you kind of have to sit out there and try to record the data as best you can even if you can't see your animals. Um, so with the advances in GPS technology over the last 10 years, we now have radio callers that take GPS points, which are called GPS callers. Um, these callers will program to take points either every hour or every 30 minutes uh, during our main study periods. And when, whenever we have two or more points within 100 meters of each other, we'll hike or we'll ski into those points uh, to see if the wolves have made a kill. Um, and once we reach a kill, we'll, we'll take some notes. Um, we'll try to see, the, of course, what species the animal is, the age of the animal by pulling a tooth. Uh, we'll saw the femur in half to look at the marrow. And then with elk, we take uh, the metatarsus, which is the back foot bone, and that's the last bone to develop in the womb. And that's just to look for stunted growth. And there's a lot of rumors that go around about exactly what wolves eat. You know, out, you know, you might hear rumors that wolves don't eat what they kill, or they kill all the elk, or they only kill the old and the sick. Uh, and by doing this, we can visit almost every kill a pack makes and determine what the characteristics are of what wolves are actually eating. Of course, GPS callers allow us to pick up dead wolves uh, to, to study their causes of death. Uh, again, the population over, over time has been pretty interesting in Yellowstone. So in 1995, we started out with about 14 wolves, and we saw a dramatic increase, right? There were no other wolves in the landscape. There were a lot of elk, so wolves did really, really well. Uh, we saw population peaks in, in the 170s. And then over the last decade or so, we saw that population kind of level out and hit a carrying capacity of about 100 wolves, and it oscillates around that. So, you know, some years it might be 120, other years it might be 80, but it typically stays somewhere around 100 individuals. And that's probably what Yellowstone, uh, at least for now, can support. So a really important um, part of documenting the number of wolves in the park is counting pups every single year. So these are a couple pups from the Junction Butte Pack. Um, pup counts can be pretty difficult. It sounds like a lot of fun, but sometimes it can be pretty hard. So this is actually a video uh, of some wolves from the Junction Butte Pack. So the Junction Butte Pack actually produced 18 pups this year. Uh, and this was our first view of 18 pups. Um, so I'll actually run this video, uh, and what you'll see, it's a pretty hazy video, um, but you still have to be able to count the number of pups and the color of the different pups. So I'll let you guys try that. We'll let this video run here for a second. So you're looking, this is the adult wolf right here with a lot of pups, and there's quite a few more pups up here by the den. So again, a lot of times, um, these pups will move in and out of the den. You only have a few seconds sometimes to be able to try to count them. Um, so it can be pretty tough to get these pup counts. So as you can obviously see, there's quite a few pups in this video. And so I actually sped it up too. I did a little time lapse so you can see the pups moving a bit better. But it just gives you a picture of how many there are. They look like ants. All right, so this is three different litters from the Junction Butte Pack, and they became one of the largest uh, pups, or largest packs because of the number of pups they produced. Um, we didn't think all the pups would survive for the end of the year, but they proved us wrong. Uh, this is a picture of at least 17 of the 18 pups and some of the adults uh, frolicking in their rendezvous site. So Junction actually became the third biggest wolf pack in the history of the planet this year uh, with 35 individuals. Um, unfortunately, we can't easily see dens for all packs, so sometimes we rely on trail cameras. So this is a video from the Rattlesnake Wilderness in Missoula, and this is a pack um, when I was working for the state that we thought only had three pups, so we put some cameras in their rendezvous site, and we got this video. So there are actually seven pups. Uh, with the seventh one lagging behind a little bit at the end of the video. So we'll dig deeper into wolf biology now. Uh, as many of you know, wolves are cooperative breeders. They live in family groups called packs. Um, and that's typically a mother 
a mother wolf, a father wolf, and their offspring. Uh, wolves uh, exhibit inbreeding avoidance, so they will avoid breeding with close relatives if the opportunity uh, is available to them. And wolves are primarily monogamous. I always compare that to kind of like how we say humans are primarily monogamous, right? Uh, some wolves are more promiscuous than others, um, but typically wolves, wolves mate for life. The leading cause of death in Yellowstone National Park for wolves is other wolves. Wolves are very territorial, uh, kind of like I mentioned before, uh, and packs are very aggressive towards each other. Second leading cause of death um, are hunting injuries. So you can imagine if you're a wolf pack trying to kill a bison or an elk, those animals don't want to die either. Uh, so we see wolves every single year typically that uh, get kicked in the face or kicked somewhere in their body uh, and are killed by their prey. Disease has reared its head a few times in Yellowstone, so we have distemper outbreaks every few years. And canine distemper uh, is a native virus. Usually when it comes through, it kills most of the pups. That's a natural regulator of the wolf population in the park. Uh, sarcoptic mange is another um, disease that um, we see in Yellowstone pretty frequently. Uh, and it was actually introduced as an eradication uh, method for wolves. In 1905, the state of Montana signed a bill into law that required veterinarians that came by a coyote or a wolf to infect it with mange and release it to infect others. Um, we've done some research on mange. Uh, this is an, a paper by Emily Almberg, who used to work for the Wolf Project. Um, on the bottom of this graph, we see pack size. And then at the top, or uh, on this side, we see the monthly hazard of mortality. In the blue, we have infected individuals. And in the black, we have uninfected individuals. And what we can basically see is that your chances of dying um, of mange, especially if you're in a big pack, uh, is basically the same for a healthy pack versus a pack that has mange. Um, and even when you're in a pretty small pack, your chances of dying of mange are not very high. So we see a lot of wolves recover from mange, uh, even though it, it definitely seems to be a pretty painful disease. Vehicle strikes uh, have been an issue in years. So what, what big issue we're dealing with right now is wolf habituation. So a lot of people come into the park to see wolves and they enjoy being close to them. Uh, and uh, the Ellison Wolf Project uh, wants people to see wolves because it's, it's a very important educational opportunity for people. It's an experience that gets them closer to nature and to wildlife. However, there's some limits to that, right? Uh, wolves being close to people is not a good thing. And wolves that get used to people almost are always killed by people some way or another. Um, this hits pretty close to home uh, for me because last winter I actually got a call and had to pick up two of the dead Junction Butte pups uh, that were hit by a car. So these pups had actually uh, were born right by a trail and there were a lot of people who went up there to see them and a lot of people went up there to photograph them. Uh, those pups got used to people, they never saw people as a threat and unfortunately in a case like this uh, these guys were, were lingering in the road and were, and were hit by a car. Um, we also had another wolf in this pack we thought we were going to have to lethally remove because he was just too comfortable around people. Uh, so I always ask people, uh, you know, we, we always hope that the sighting or the photograph is not more important than the animal's life. Outside the park, the leading cause of death uh, for, for wolves is human harvest. So wolves have recovered uh, really well in the states of Wyoming, Idaho, and Montana. All three states now have hunting seasons on wolves. Uh, wolves from, that live primarily within Yellowstone National Park or spend about 95% of their time in the park. Um, we see most of the harvest just north of the boundary here uh, near Gardner, Montana, kind of by Cook City, Montana. Um, and those areas, the state has recognized uh, that those wolves bring in a lot of money to this economy. So the quotas in these units now are actually down to one wolf in each unit. Uh, and that has helped uh, you know, relieve some of, some of the stress and the tension uh, on, on Yellowstone National Park's packs. Um, so for wolves, feeding is a really important part of their lives. Uh, and how much food a wolf consumes when they're on a carcass depends, depends on several different factors. So scavengers are really important. Wolves provide food for several different species when they make a kill. Uh, ravens are the biggest one. So we've documented over 200 ravens on wolf-killed carcasses in Yellowstone. There's, all, there's a borderline symbiosis uh, between wolves and ravens. Where of course you know uh, ravens are kleptoparasites, so they will uh, benefit when wolves make a kill because they can feed off of that. But uh, ravens have also been observed leading wolves to fresh kills. Uh, grizzly bears uh, come in on a lot of wolf kills in the summer. They typically will take kills over from wolves. Um, we see smaller scavengers like coyotes and foxes visiting wolf kills, but at their own peril. Um, and we have of course two different species of eagles: the golden eagles and the bald eagles that will come in on those kills. Uh, there's hundreds of different species of invertebrates and, and other scavengers we, we haven't mentioned. 
Of course, again, it can be dangerous at a carcass. Uh, so this is an eagle that somehow was injured by a carcass. And this is a curious yearling from the Junction Butte Pack, uh, 1229, investigating the eagle. So 1229 didn't actually kill this eagle. This eagle, uh, she was just more curious about it. But unfortunately, it already had a broken wing from some other incident, uh, and it likely did die um, later on. So carcasses can be a pretty uh, risky spot for some of those smaller predators to be. Pack size is also really important, right? When you have a pack of four wolves, you're going to get more food than a pack of 18 or 20 wolves. Interestingly enough, pack size also factors into how successful wolves are at killing their prey. Uh, so when wolves are hunting elk, we see a peak at about four wolves as the optimum hunting size. So this is uh, the hunting, the, the group size in the bottom, so a pack of five, pack of ten, pack of fifteen, and your probability of success. So that's zero percent, that's eighteen percent, and that's thirty-six percent. So what the first thing I want everyone to notice is that wolves are really bad at hunting. They're successful um, less than ten percent of the time, but their optimum is about four individuals. And we can attribute that probably to sometimes there are too many cooks in the kitchen, right? You only you might only need four wolves to actually successfully bring down an elk uh, at an optimum level. Pack size is also really important um, in territorial conflict. We mentioned that was the leading cause of death. So Kira Cassidy, uh, who's one of the research associates with the Elston Wolf Project, did her master's degree on this. This is relative pack size on the bottom. So if this is a pack that's outnumbered by two, a pack that's outnumbered by four. This is a pack uh, that has the advantage by two and then by four. And then we see the probability of winning. So 10%, 70%, 100%. Basically, if you add just one wolf, your probability of winning is about 70%. And by the time you get to three or four, you're pretty close to 100. So pack size is really, really important in winning those territorial battles. But the most important thing is actually the number of old wolves in your pack the number of wolves that are six plus years old. Um, and that can possibly be attributed to wisdom, right? Like a pack of four old wolves might see a pack of six younger wolves coming and say, hey, you know, we're gonna avoid them. As opposed to a pack of four younger wolves who might see a pack of six wolves coming and say, yeah, we can take them. We, we have, you know, the power to do that. Um, the other important thing was the number of large males in the pack. And that was the third most important factor. And that leads us to prey size. So in the winter time, uh, wolves typically are hunting in, uh, as, a, as, a, as a unit, so they'll hunt and, they'll, and their, their whole pack will travel together and they'll be killing larger ungulates. In the summertime, we see wolves hunting alone or in small groups more often, uh, and they're typically targeting calves. And that leads us to the species composition of wolf killed prey. So in Yellowstone National Park, all I want people to really get from this graph um, is that wolves are mostly taking elk at Yellowstone. So this is the season on the bottom, which is our study periods, early winter, late winter, spring, and summer. And then we have the proportion of wolf kills from zero to 100%. Elk are gray, right? So every single month, wolves are primarily taking elk. So at times it's hard to tell what a wolf kill is, right? So this is actually a video of the Wapiti Lake Pack uh, from a few years ago at Elk Creek in Yellowstone. Uh, and we could see the wolves that had killed. There were a lot of scavengers coming out of the gully nearby, uh, some eagles perched in the trees, but we couldn't figure out what the wolves had actually killed. And this pup gave it away when it picked up a radio collar of an elk uh, and that it was using as a chew toy. So the wolves had killed a cow elk. Uh, just keep an eye on this pup right here. So he picks up his new chew toy, the elk radio collar, and carries it off. So that gave us an idea that it was a cow elk that the wolves had killed. Um, this is the composition of wolf killed elk, right? So this is basically the same graph, early winter, late winter, spring and summer, and then the proportion of kills. What we can see, so the, the gray and the white are female adult, or female adult elk and male adult elk. And what we can see in the early winter and late winter, wolves are primarily taking uh, those, those older adult, or those adult elk. In the summertime, that shifts to newborn or neonatal calves. Um, wolves are getting less biomass in the summer, but they're killing more prey. 
In the wintertime, they're getting more biomass, however, they're killing fewer prey. In recent years, we've actually seen a shift um, with wolves starting to kill more and more bison. So when wolves were reintroduced to Yellowstone National Park in 1995, it took two years before wolves even killed a single bison. However, in 2019, we saw the highest percentage of wolf kills that were bison that we've ever seen in the park, and it was almost 20%. Uh, so when I made this graph, I was actually a little surprised to see how, um, how much the, the percentage of bison kills mirrors the percentage of elk kills. Um, it'll be interesting to see going forward what that means for the population. Uh, will we continue to see wolves taking more and more bison? Um, this last winter study, uh, we were uh, the crew that was assigned to the Jun Junction Butte Pack, which, which I and a couple other wolf project technicians were on, uh, found that the junctions actually killed almost two times as many bison as elk. And that was the first time we've ever seen that in Yellowstone. Um, so going forward, what does that mean? Um, why are wolves starting to kill more bison? And I think there's a few different factors. Uh, number one, there's a lot of bison on the landscape. There's fewer elk on the landscape than there used to be. Um, wolves are probably just learning how to kill bison now. Um, so those, those are probably three factors that influence uh, wolves killing bison yells in the National Park. Of course, we're also seeing really big pack sizes, like the Junction Butte pack, for example, is 35 wolves. Um, so they need more meat uh, to feed that many individuals. Uh, will wolves continue to kill bison? Uh, will it ever get to the point where it kind of um, becomes more than elk? I mean, that's something you know we're continuing to learn even after 25 years of studying these individuals. So this is the last really big graph I have, and this gets back uh, to our cluster data. So I know it's, it's a tough to look at, but we'll walk through it slowly. So again, like we said, our GPS collars will hike or ski into clusters uh, of, of wolf points to see what wolves killed. Uh, and this is kind of uh, gets down to the nitty gritty of that data, right? So we'll look at the yellow first. Um, at the bottom, we have the female elk age in years. So two year old elk, 20 year old elk, your proportion here, and then your probability here. But again, let's look at the yellow. So that's the age distribution of the entire elk population in Yellowstone. What we can see is most of the elk in Yellowstone National Park are pretty young, right? So two probably to eight years old. Uh, that makes up the pro uh, most of the female elk in Yellowstone National Park. The gray is the age distribution of wolf kills. Um, so what we can see is that wolves are actually selecting for elk that are 16 to 18 years old. So older elk. Um, what we can also see here is pregnancy in the black, right? So um, young elk don't reach their reproductive prime until they're about 12 years old, and then that drops dramatically, right? So wolves are also targeting elk that are well past their reproductive prime. Um, we can look at survival, which is in the pink. What we basically see is as you know, an elk gets older, your chances of survival drop. And that's true of all animals, right? That's true of humans, that's true of wolves, that's true of elk, that's true of everything. Uh, as you get older, you're, you're more likely to die. Um, finally, blue is wolf cause mortality. And what we can see is that young elk have basically 0% chance of getting killed by wolves. Uh, but as the elk get older, the probability of wolves killing them gets higher and higher. So what we can see, you know, this is just the solid data, uh, that wolves are targeting uh, female elk that are past their reproductive prime uh, and that are probably not contributing a whole lot to the population. Uh, and that's just the data we've gathered in Yellowstone from going to all these kills. You know, we have people um, very, very frequently uh, who say wolves kill all the elk or wolves kill only the old and the sick. Um, and this is what we've learned uh, over the past few years of just studying these animals. So after getting through all those tough graphs, uh, here's a video of a Wapiti Lake wolf pup chasing his tail. So he finally catches it. And then sits down. So we'll get back to the elk population, right? This is the elk population in Yellowstone National Park uh, over the last many, many years. This is wolf reintroduction. We see an obvious decline after the reintroduction to wolves. And a lot of people um, like to blame wolves for that decline. However, what we like to point out as well is that we didn't have as many, wolf as many wolves in the landscape at that point. We had about 14 wolves. 
it's unlikely that they were responsible for that whole decline, right? At the same time, we saw an increasing uh, number of cougars in the park. Coug the main prey of cougars uh, is also elk. We saw an increasing number of grizzly bears in the park. Um, and of all the elk calves that die every single year, grizzlies actually take about 50% of the newborn elk calves. Um, we saw an increasing bison population in the park, which some argue um, bison uh, compete with elk for forage. And of course, humans never like to blame ourselves, but we were also harvesting cow elk outside the park border. So all those probably came together to drive the population down, right? Wolves definitely had some, something to do with that, uh, but we would be foolish to say they were the only, uh, the only thing involved in the decline of the elk. At the same time, we saw um, severe winters and severe drought. Again, all that worked together to drive the elk population down. And at points, we had almost 19,000 elk in the northern range of Yellowstone. Uh, and today, it's probably a more sustainable 4 to, 4 to 8,000 uh, in the northern part of the park. And that brings us back as we wrap up uh, to our food pyramid, right? We have wolves and cougars back on the landscape now. <clears throat> and biologists like to argue about a lot of different things, right? Um, are we seeing recovery of willow, cottonwoods, grasses because there are fewer elk on the landscape or because wolves are scaring elk out of riparian areas? To some, to some level, it, it doesn't matter that much, right? The, the bottom line is no biologist uh, will say that a, a landscape with wolves is the same as a landscape without wolves, right? So because we have these large predators back, um, we're seeing an increase in those plant, in, in, the, in the recruitment of those plants, right? Again, uh, wolf advocates always like to say it's only due to wolves, right? It's not only due to wolves. It's probably also due to the presence of cougars and bears, uh, human harvest and drought and winter uh, impacting that elk population as a whole. But again, all that trickles all the way down to the soil, right? We've seen the beaver population increase in the park since reintroduction. Um, is that all because of wolves? Uh, there was a reintroduction of beavers just outside the park, so that might have had something to do with it as well. Um, there's argument that because we've seen an increase in willow and grasslands and, and um, aspens, uh, increased songbird habitat, right? Increased habitat for things like moose is also a possibility. Uh, it's crazy to me to think that an animal like this Wilson's warbler uh, could be impacted by an animal like a cougar or a wolf. Uh, but that is how uh, interwoven uh, all, the, all the cogs in these ecosystems are. Uh, so when we remove one aspect of an ecosystem, uh, it's very important we understand that first uh, because we don't know what, what the impacts of that could be. So this is a photograph that was taken before reintroduction uh, at the confluence of the Lamar River and Soda Butte Creek. You can see there's not really too much, there's, there, there's no willows growing there. This is after the reintroduction. We can see the, the, a major increase in the willows, right? This is Blacktail Deer Creek. Uh, before reintroduction, major erosion issues. This is today. Uh, is that all due to wolves? Probably not. But having them back on the landscape, having cougars back on the landscape, having increased grizzly bears, you know, again, human harvest of elk, all those factors that drove the elk population down has allowed the ecosystem to kind of come back. Right? We still see a healthy elk population in the park. They're still our most abundant large ungulate, um, and our most abundant large mammal, excuse me. Um, and, and again, we, we're, also, we're just seeing the ecosystem more healthy as a whole because of that. So this is the last part about wolf biology we'll dig into. So Dan Staler, um, who is a, of a, one of the lead biologists for the Wolf Project, did his PhD work on the genetics of gray wolves. Um, so if you're in Yellowstone, you might see a wolf pack and you'll notice that the wolves range in color from basically black to white. We have two different color, uh, color phases in Yellowstone, gray wolves and black wolves. They're all the same species. Um, the black color coat actually came from interbreeding with domestic dogs thousands of years ago. Uh, the black tends to be the dominant, uh, the do or is the dominant gene. Um, so interestingly, two black wolves can have either gray pups or black pups, but two gray wolves can only have gray pups. Um, black wolves tend to have a higher immunity to disease and to live longer, but gray wolves tend to be more aggressive and more reproductively successful. And the most interesting part about that to me, uh, what Dan found, was that wolves actually prefer to breed with the opposite color and they're the only mammal that does that. So in Yellowstone we see a disproportionate number, disproportionate, disproportionate excuse me, number uh, of wolves that are breeding a gray, a gray and a, bl a black are breeding. Uh, as opposed to the same color, which is pretty interesting. So we'll wrap this talk up by talking about wolf recovery. Right? So this is the historic wolf range across the lower 48 states. 
Wolves were really widely distributed across the lower 48 states. This, this map might not be completely accurate. There's definitely some, some argument about where exactly they lived. Uh, but wolves were very widespread across the lower 48. And we did a really good job of eradicating them. Um, by their low point in the 1950s, there were only about 700 wolves left in the north woods of Minnesota. So the wolves have been completely exterminated from the western United States. Um, from there, wolves actually started to recolonize after they were protected. Um, and they spread further down into Minnesota. They, they recolonized Wisconsin, and then they were able to recolonize the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. So the Great Lakes states got their wolves back. In the 1970s, um, wolves began to recolonize Glacier National Park uh, from, from Canada. And then the reintroduction into Yellowstone happened. And that reintroduction project was the most successful carnivore recovery project in the history of the planet. Right? It has been overwhelmingly successful. Right? So the reintroduction into Idaho and the reintroduction into Wyoming, our goals were about 150 wolves in each state. Today, Wyoming has over 300. Montana has over 800. And Idaho has about 1,000. Wolves from those states have started to move into Washington and Oregon. Those states both have populations of about 150. And then I'll introduce you to a very uh, specific wolf. This is wolf number OR7, or... He's been called Journey by a lot of different people. OR7 was born in the Imnaha Pack in Northeast Oregon. And as a two-year-old, he walked all the way across the state and became the first wolf to walk into Northern California in over 100 years. He didn't find a mate in California, but he crossed the border back into Oregon and found a mate near Crater Lake National Park. This is wolf OR7. He was born into the Imnaha Pack in Northeast Oregon, and as a two-year-old wolf, he dispersed across the state and became the first wolf to walk into Northern California in over a hundred years. He wasn't able to find a mate in Northern California, but he crossed the border back into Oregon near Crater Lake National Park, where he was successful, and he formed a pack called the Rogue Pack, and he produced pups. This is one of his pups. And I don't know if it was this pup specifically, um, no one does. But when one of these pups grew up, he followed in his father's footsteps. And he walked back into California where he found a mate. And that created this pack, the Lassen Pack. This is a video from earlier, from, from 2020, of the Lassen Pack's pups. Uh, one of the first packs to live in Northern California in over 100 years. Recently, we got news out of California that another wolf from Oregon had made the trip uh, to the northern part of the state where he had found uh, a gray female. So it looks like another pack uh, is forming uh, in northern California. I asked all kinds of biologists this question. You know, Doug Smith, who's my boss, uh, I said, hey, did you ever think in 25 years uh, that there would be wolf packs living in northern California? And he said, no way. I mean, we would have been happy with 150 in Montana. So that just gives you a picture about how wildly successful the reintroduction project has been uh, and the recovery of wolves to the western United States. I wanted to introduce you to another wolf. Not quite as famous. This is Wolf 1084 of uh, Yellowstone National Park Snake River Pack, which lived in the southwest corner of the park. Oh, excuse me, the southeast corner of the park. So we radio collared him uh, as a young wolf. And our pilot uh, was tracking him one time and it found him pretty far south, he near Lander, Wyoming, near the uh, southern extent of the Gray Wolf Range in Wyoming. And then he went missing. And in the summer of 2019, Colorado Parks and Wildlife sent us this picture. It said, what is this animal? What is this that's running around in our state? So we sent them our radio frequencies. Sure enough, wolf number 1084 had made it all the way across Wyoming uh, and was running around in Colorado, where there hadn't been a, a wolf population since the 1940s. Last year in the fall, a hunter hunting in the northwest corner of Colorado uh, ran into a group of six large gray canines. So he reported it to Colorado Parks and Wildlife, who went in and set up trail cameras. Sure enough, they were able to confirm the first wolf pack to live in northern Colorado uh, in many, many years. And just recently, Colorado wolves got political. Uh, the last election in 2020, uh, there was this proposition on the ballot. Shall Colorado, or should Colorado reintroduce gray wolves? 
and it passed in Colorado. Um, there's, there's some arguments for and some arguments against, right? Uh, wolves used to live in Colorado. Bringing them back um, is something that would definitely be beneficial to the ecosystem. Uh, however, is it okay uh, to allow wildlife biology decisions to be made by the general public, right? Uh, it sets a precedent, right? What if next year this is grizzly bears uh, or something even crazier? Um, however, it doesn't really matter at this point. Um, this did pass, and by 2023, Colorado Parks and Wildlife is required to reintroduce wolves to the west slope of the state. This is a video that was taken by one of my friends um, of that pack in northwest Colorado a little earlier in 2020. And the most recent news out of Colorado was that uh, our old 1084, the black wolf that went down there from, uh, from here, from Yellowstone National Park, uh, had a friend. So Colorado Parks and Wildlife is able to capture and collar uh, this gray male wolf who is traveling with 1084. So there are already a handful of wolves in the state, and it looks like wolf recovery is going to be pretty successful. Um, this is wolf 2101, the first wolf to be radio collared in Colorado in, uh, in 2021. Um, and I like to wrap up the talk by going back to the map, right? Um, in, in today's world, politically, environmentally, uh, there's a lot of negatives we can look at. But wolf recovery is not one of them, right? Uh, with recovery in Colorado and recovery in California, uh, within the 20, next 20 years or so, we're looking at uh, complete recovery of gray wolves in the western United States. Um, which is something that back in 1995 when we reintroduced them to Yellowstone, we never dreamed would be possible. Um, that's pretty much how we'll wrap up this talk. Um, but wolf recovery is a pretty successful, uh, pretty successful endeavor uh, from, from the new wolf populations in California uh, to the new populations in Colorado. Uh, wolf recovery looks to be on a good path. Um, that started with the reintroduction in Yellowstone National Park. That's it.